But we're in this really toxic mix of a bunch of different perfect storms all lining up at the same time, right? So the election controversial, get it. Uh, the, the COVID-19 thing is really rattling people from being in isolation. And, and, and but like even major institutions are shifting things that haven't shifted in a really long time. And I'm not meaning to pick on anybody, but you know, the Pope was quoted this week in a, in a statement that on a, uh, a documentary film that he made, and he was in favor of civil unions for same-sex couples, okay? Now, I mean, that's 2,000 years, the first time that's ever happened. If that doesn't let you know that we're in a real, like, toxic brew of things shifting around and I'm not trying to judge anybody, I'm just saying I cannot defend that in the Bible. I can't defend it. So we can't stand up here and say it's okay. And somebody could say, well, do you think you know more than the Pope? I'd say, no, I don't know anything. I just know how I read my Bible. And I'm willing to let anybody come and tell me how to defend that position. But I can't defend it. And, and that makes it tough, doesn't it? Because it makes it look like you don't love people. But tough love is always tough. We had Jack Frost come here many years ago, and because he loved a good friend of his that he knew was cheating on his wife, he snuck in the guy's house and waited in the garage. And then when that guy pulled in the garage at 3 o'clock in the morning, Jack Frost stepped out of the shadows and said, where were you? And he says, I know where you were. You were with your mistress. Now, he could have got shot. Right? So you walk in somebody else's property and they don't know you're there. They could shoot you. But that's what tough love does. It takes a chance. It's because I love you that I, I feel compelled to have to tell you what the Word of God says. There might be different interpretations for different things, but I'm telling you, sexual sin is really black and white. You make a covenant commitment to somebody for life, and that's when God blesses it. Every other version of that is not not blessed by God. Amen. And I'm sorry, like, who wants to be this real, like, difficult person to deal with? I'm, I think that's what the world needs right now. They need a compass to point back to the truth. Yeah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we really should shine right now in the darkness. Right? Patricia King, I think she even wrote a book called Light Belongs in the Darkness. So if it's getting dark around us, that shouldn't discourage us. You have to say, this is going to give Jesus a, a better chance to make his case for why it's better to live as a Christian and, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Amen? Amen? So we have to take a stand for righteousness. We have to counter this unprecedented attack against traditional family values. That's what's happening right now. Your children, if they're going to public school, are being told that they can pick which gender they want to be. I mean, I'm, I've been living here a long time. I never would have thought in my lifetime that would be an agreed-upon position in public schools. I don't want my tax dollars going for that. There's no scientific evidence of any of those things. We're made in his image, male and female. Why is this so difficult? Amen. Because if you can get people confused about their identity, you can control them. Amen. And we're not under anything, any other control but God. And that's why they came here, risked their lives, they started the country and said, this is going to be a free country. And you know, free speech is not a fun thing, because you have to, that means you have to let other people say things you don't want to hear. But when there's merit behind it, it'll last. Because there's bones, and there's truth in it, and the truth is marching on, as Lisa sang in that song, Glory Hallelujah. So we should not be afraid to defend Christianity against any other worldview. 2,000 years, we've attracted the greatest minds to Christianity, and it's proven over and over again. If you want to fight it, that's fine. In fact, you probably should contend with the truth of the word to make sure you understand, I can believe this. I can set the course of my life around the truth of the word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit. So my, my declaration, my my. Things not working here because my communion spilled on my computer, so it got baptized in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Just the keyboard. But that's okay. God gave me a workaround. So here's the question I want, I want you to ask yourself, and, and it should always be on the top focus of your mind. We have to say, who has the final authority over my life? God. 
Okay? God has final authority. The word of God has to have final authority. Yeah. Not politicians, not the shifting and the sinking sands of our culture. It's the truth of the word of God. It's marching on. Yeah. And even if there's a rebellion against it, and even if we go into a civil war, I'm not saying that we are, but even if we did, it doesn't change the truth of the word. And that's what we have to live by. That's my compass. The Holy Spirit is in me as as an assistant, as a helper, as a comforter, to say, if you go into persecution, and let's be honest, most of us have not. We have lived a really good life, but the sleeping church might be part of the cause of the problem in the culture. We were telling, you know, here in Lance Wall now 15 years ago, saying the Christians need to rise up in the mountains, the seven mountains of the culture. We can't just hide in the church and say, come back and get us, Jesus, and get us out of here. Right? We, we're not here to evacuate, we're here to occupy, Jesus said, until I come back. And if we're not in the culture, we can't shift the culture. And you know, the Bible says judgment has to begin in the house of the Lord. So if there's problems in the culture, that means part of that is on us for not taking enough of a stand. All right, well, that sounds like it get political. I don't mean it to. It's the culture. That's what shapes the culture. Christians should be involved. Who's the... Who's the Who's a, is that a senator, Scott, from North Carolina or South Carolina? I mean, the guy's amazing. What a testimony he's had. He took a stand. The man who ended slavery in England, William Wilberforce, was talked out of going into the ministry by the guy that wrote Amazing Grace. <laughs> John Newton said, you're going to have more of an impact for the kingdom of God in Congress. Parliament would be their way of saying it. And that's the guy for 30 years, his singular purpose was to end slavery in England. And he did, through the help of God. And not too long after that, slavery ended in America, after the Civil War. It was Christians behind the, the end of that oppression. You can look at whatever version of history you want. That's just a fact. That's what happened. So I'm, I want to stick to the word right now. Missionaries aren't worried about the local culture when they get there because they know the word of God is so strong and so good that whatever sin and whatever spirits are operating in that area, God's spirit is greater. So we have to like plunge into the darkness sometimes and allow God to use us there when it would be safer to stay home. How about this one? I love this. Elijah in 1 Kings 18.21, he says, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. Yeah. How many would say that? I believe the Lord is God, and I'm going to follow him. Doesn't mean I don't love people if I disagree with them. It's okay. That, that's allowed. You can disagree with people that you love, but you should always respect them. And we don't want to call them names. We don't want to be what we don't want to be. We don't want to be, if we don't like something in somebody else, why should we become the thing we don't like to try to win that that argument, you're not trying to win an argument, you're trying to tell people the truth. And you need Holy Spirit to help you know how to do that today. Because look, these problems are very complex. I'm in no way minimizing how difficult it is to try to solve them. But the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. So that's been the purpose of the enemy is just to try to get us divided and to lose our identity and even make it hard for people to go to church. Well, whose plan was that? God? The devil, of course. I'm not saying don't be careful and don't follow rules, but look, I, don't, I, I said it's like a perfect storm. You isolate people for months and months. Forsake not the assembly together with other believers. There's a reason that's in there. We need each other. We've got to hear each other. We've got to be in the corporate anointing. There's something about the prophetic words that flow when we're together that encourage people. It's not that it can't happen when you're on your own, but no one else is, is in that place with you at the time. You believe there's power in numbers, right? Yeah. If one puts 1,000 to flight, two put 10,000, how many are here right now? And you guys are hardcore. This is awesome. Yeah. You could have stayed home. You could have just watched it. No, you stepped out of the house and said, I'm not staying home. Oh, and that, you know, obviously I would love it when you come, but that's part of the choice you're making. And then similarly, Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we've already chosen. We're serving the Lord. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you today because 
I don't really, in, in some ways, it doesn't matter what happens in the culture. I'm staying laser focused on who God called me to be and what he called me to do. And if I get persecuted for that, that's going to be part of the deal. The Bible says that. You're not going to live a godly life without persecution. <laughs> and then in verse uh, 3 of Psalm chapter 11, a lot of you probably know this. I'm using the voice translation. It says, if the foundations are crumbling, is there hope for the righteous? Say yes. yes. There is. Because God is still on the throne, okay? This is Psalm 11. You can look at it when, you're, uh, when you have time. In verse 2, it says, the wicked approach with their bows bent, and sneaking around in the shadows, they set their arrows against the bowstring and they're ready to fire that arrow. If the foundations are crumbling, is there hope for the righteous? The eternal has not moved. He's still on the throne. He remains in his holy temple. He sits squarely on his heavenly throne. That's the God we serve. Greater than any politician. How about this one? Hold up your Bible if you got it handy. Because we need to just make a decree about the Word of God. Even if it's on your phone, it's okay. Electric, electronic versions are legal here. <laughs> I'm reading from the Amplified, classic version. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. As you hold that word up, the Word of God is living and active. You believe that? The thing you're holding in your hand has a heartbeat. It's alive. It, it's able to speak into situations that have never happened before because it's a dynamic book. It's alive with the power of the Spirit. The Word is alive, living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Yeah. You know, this was in the Roman, the days of the Romans. They were the ones coming with the two-edged swords to take you by violence. This is sharper than the physical sword because... Oh, look at that. I, I started a video by mistake. Sorry. You'll have to wait for another t turn. <laughs> and what does it do? What does this word do? I better close the cover, then it won't start on me. That'll be better. There you go. It cuts me, too. The word cuts me, too. It pierces me, it says, to the division of soul and spirit. Who's going to win? The word of God or the temptation that I'm facing? The word of God, the spirit, it pier the word pierces me. And I have, a, I have a feeling this is why a lot of people don't read the Bible enough, because it's very convicting. <laughs> because if I read it, that means I have to do it, because <laughs> it's true. And it's just easier to hold the grudge sometimes, isn't it? And, and it'll help me discern the thoughts and intentions of my heart, and, and it'll help other people do the same thing. But this is the part that really hit me. It says, no creature is hidden from the sight of the word of God, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? We're going to have to give an account someday. 